All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is our kind of specialty session on insurance for strata corporations with sections, airspace parcels, and those strata corporations who run commercial enterprises. Many thanks to Allison Baker from Clark Wilson, um, who is going to give a legal perspective. Um, Steve Story from BFL Canada Insurance Services, uh, who's gonna talk about this from an insurance broker's perspective. And then of course myself, um, I'm gonna act as the moderator and I'll be vetting through all of your questions so when we get to the end, we'll try and get to many of them, if not all of them, um, directly right away. Um, thanks to BFL Canada for sponsoring this week's seminar. Um, it really makes a great difference to us. Uh, and if you have any questions, um, I've got the emails for everyone posted at the end of the um, session. You'll be able to email um, Steve directly at BFL. Just a reminder that this is a webinar. It's for educational purposes. It does not at any point whatsoever during the meeting constitute legal advice to any of the questions posed because none of the facilitators will have the resources, uh, the documents, or the particulars of all the details and the evidence to be able to answer in that capacity. If you have any follow-up questions regarding a legal issue, regarding a claim, please, by all means, contact your broker, contact the lawyer that you work with. Um, Allison will be also very happy to help you as we go through the process. Um, so we start right in uh, with insurance rates and deductibles. And I think, Steve, do we start with you or with Allison? I think we start with um, Allison, perhaps. I think this one's on me. Uh, okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll start with the first one. Yeah. There we go. Um, yeah, I think that, that what we wanted to sort of touch on in this slide is just overall uh, for, for strata corporations and, and even commercial entities, um, just uh, evalu you know, evaluating your, your property conditions, addressing defects, maintenance, et cetera, on your property is, is very important. Um, for strata corporations, specifically educating your owners, tenants uh, on the benefits of having their own insurance um, this can be residential owners, it can be commercial owners, it can be, um, in some cases, commercial tenants or residential tenants even, uh, educating the importance of having insurance um, and, and things that they can do to reduce losses out of their units, whether they're a tenant or an occupant or an owner, um, uh, maintenance within the unit, et cetera, all very important. I think one thing we've learned over the last uh, 15 months specifically is, is the importance of individual owners taking ownership of, of uh, maintenance within their unit and how that can impact claims claims and, and premiums and deductibles in the future. Um, reviewing your bylaws to determine if there's any conditions that, uh, that you may be able to remove or any, anything you may be able to, any risk you may be able to remove through bylaws, smoking bylaws, um, cooking on balconies, barbecues on balconies, bylaws, those sort of things. Uh, I can speak from a, from a claims perspective. Um, a lot of the large fires we've seen in the multi-unit residential class have been caused by um, cigarettes, either discarded cigarettes or people falling asleep with cigarettes, uh, that sort of things. Cause, so those can have a big impact on the severity of claims. Um, so you don't see the big fires every day, but when they happen, they're, they're, they can be significant, anywhere from 10 to, I think our largest over the last five years, maybe 30 million. Um, so significant losses, uh, a lot of premiums have to be paid to, uh, to pay off that 30 million. Um, depreciation reports, obviously a hot topic uh, today, uh, always has been, um, you know, I can speak from the insurance industry perspective. I think we see value in depreciation reports. Um, what they lead to is funding for future maintenance and projects. Typically, if the money's there, ideally they lead to funding, I should say. Um, and, um, you know, if the money's there, typically the, the maintenance gets done. If it's a special levy, that sort of thing, not always. It's usually more of a reactive thing. There's really starting to be an issue and, and that's when it happens. Um, and work closely with your, your, your property management team, your insurance broker, and make sure you understand all these things, get advice on risk management, things you can do as a corporation to, to reduce loss. Different types of policies within, uh, within these uh, strata corporations or, or even mixed use uh, complexes. 
Uh, there's obviously the strata corporations policy, the strata property act dictate, dictates the minimums uh, for insurance for the strata corporation. Um, you know, there's a lot of different policies involved in these projects, uh, strata lot owner policies that could be a residential owner uh, insuring their own unit. Uh, could be a commercial owner, um, a commercial strata lot owner in a mixed use development, insuring their, their unit and potentially their operations. Um, uh, and even in a hundred percent commercial strata, uh, could be a commercial owner or a commercial landlord <laughs> insuring, uh, the, who's leasing to a tenant. There's a lot of different policies that, that could be in place, both in the residential side and the commercial play, uh, side. Um, and once again, it's important to connect with, with your, your insurance advisor to make sure that uh, you have the proper coverages in place. Uh, commercial enterprises policies, commercial operations, uh, you know, you've got, um, let's say, um, uh, a convenience store operating in a mixed use development. Um, they, they need insurance. They need insurance for their, their contents, their, their stock, uh, their liability. Uh, obviously for customers coming in and out of the space, um, that sort of thing. Uh, insurance policies on vehicles, of course, um, I, mostly IC, IB, IC, ICBC in BC. Um, and uh, then construction warranties, which is, we, we don't get involved with, but those are purchased um, uh, typically by the developer when they're building the projects um, to cover, war you know, cover uh, components of the building that they, that they put in. I think you hey, muted, Allison. Yeah, I think so. Oh, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> so as a starting point on the uh, legal side, the Strata Property Act sets up some basic requirements for strata corporations in terms of the insurance that the strata is required to obtain and maintain. Uh, the two primary types of insurance that a strata corporation has to obtain and maintain. The first is property damage coverage. And property damage coverage deals with claims for damage to certain property. So, for example, if a um, common property pipe leaks and damages uh, a strata lot or damages the common hallways, um, the property that is covered under the strata corporation's insurance policy would be um, uh, attended to under that policy. And so what the act does, and I'll get into a bit more detail in a second, provides that the strata has to take out property damage insurance for specified types of property for full replacement value. So full replacement value is how much money do you need to rebuild the strata corporation as it is today if the building was uh, totally lost. For example, a, a complete fire loss claim. Um, and the Act also, in conjunction with the regulation, sets out a specified list of perils. And a peril is essentially a cause of a, an insurance claim. So the tech, second primary type of insurance that the strata has to take out is general liability coverage. And that is for claims against the Strata Corporation and others associated for the, uh, uh, with the Strata Corporation where um, a third party has suffered uh, an injury or uh, suffered property damage. So for example, if somebody was visiting the Strata Corporation and slipped and fell in the, in the lobby and brought a claim against the Strata Corporation, uh, the Strata Corporation's liability policy would be the one that would respond to that type of claim. <clears throat> so what does the Strata's insurance actually cover? And, and this is the property damage coverage. Uh, I've just mentioned that there's specified property that must be insured under the Strata's property damage coverage. Um, the first is the common property. That's kind of an obvious one. Uh, the second is common assets. And I'll talk about those in a moment. Um, any buildings that show up on your Strata plan have to be insured under the, under the Strata Corporation's insurance policy. And then finally, unless the strata plan is a bare land strata plan, and you're only going to know that by looking at your strata plan uh, and looking for the words bare land, um, the, all of the fixtures that were built in or installed in a strata lot by the owner developer as part of the original construction of the building, 
those are all insured by the Strata Corporation's insurance policy. And I often will say to Strata Corporations, it's a bit of a misnomer to call it the Strata Corporation's insurance policy. What it is, is the Strata is essentially a vehicle for obtaining insurance on the building and making sure that in the event of a total loss, there will be insurance coverage um, available to rebuild the building. Um, if we left it to individual owners, we might not have sufficient coverage in the event of a uh, total loss. So what does the act uh, say about fixtures and common assets? So um, in the regulations, there's a definition of fixtures. Fixtures are defined as items that are attached to the building, including floor coverings and wall coverings, electrical and plumbing fixtures, um, but does not include if they can be removed without damage to the building, uh, various types of appliances, such as refrigerators or stoves, because essentially in most cases, all you do is plug them in or you might connect them up to uh, a water supply line or there'd be a wastewater discharge in the case of uh, uh, washing machines. Um, but for the most part, what's insured under the Stratus insurance policy is the strata lot as it was originally built by the owner developer, um, excluding appliances that can easily be removed. Um, common assets are assets that are uh, owned by the Strata Corporation. Um, it's, and uh, it can be personal property. So it could be things like um, gym equipment in a gym, um, or it could be land. So if a Strata Corporation owns uh, a caretaker suite or has an interest in a separate um, parcel of land, um, uh, such as a uh, 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 a property that might be owned by several strata corporations that are running a, a joint a recreational facility. We've seen that happen on in a number of instances. That would be a, a common asset of the strata corporation. Um, and similarly, uh, sections uh, can uh, own common assets. There's no different name for them. They're just common assets held by the section as opposed to common assets held by the strata corporation. Yeah, so I, th I think for, for uh, this is my piece, I think. Uh, yeah, just giving some examples of fixtures, obviously furnaces, heating, cooling systems, sinks, cabinets, plumbing, tubs, toilets, light fixtures, um, all those things Allison just, just mentioned in her previous piece. Um, On to maybe the next slide there, Tony. Um, the examples of, of common assets, uh, you know, Allison threw a few examples in there as well, but um, exercise equipment, computer and concierge desk, strata lots owned by the strata corporation or a section, example, a caretaker suite. Um, important to note on those sort of things, you know, if, if a strata corporation does own a, a unit in a strata, in, a, in their strata, um, you know, do they rent it out? Potentially, they should record. You know, they should have rental income coverage, that sort of thing, um, to in case they lose use of that suite due to a, an insured loss. Um, garden equipment, EV, EV charging equipment, all that sort of stuff uh, could be considered common assets depending on the specific corporation. Um, mandatory perils for property damage. I mean, the Act lays out uh, some perils. Uh, fire, smoke, windstorm, hail, explosion, water escape, lightning strike, riots and civil commotion, imp impact by aircraft vehicles, vandalism, malicious acts. Um, some of these can be interpreted in, in certain ways, but, you know, if you have an all risk insurance policy, um, it's typically going to cover off all these perils. Um, and and uh, we'll get into it a little later on, but a lot of strata corporations add coverage for additional perils as well. Uh, the one item in here that can be confusing is water escape. Uh, what's the definition of water escape? Um, is that a broken pipe? Is that a, is that a sewer backup? Is that a flood? Uh, you know, a river? Yeah, I mean, those to me are all water escaping from somewhere. Um, so uh, yeah, I think that's the, the one sort of peril that's not necessarily a peril for insurance, but it's listed in the act. Um, 
what's optional? So lots of lots of perils that most strata corporations in BC buy, uh, most commercial entities in BC buy these coverages as well. Um, they but they are perils that are are added on in most cases um, from a property perspective out of these perils anyways. Um, to, to an all risk policy. So earthquakes and add on most, most strata corporations in BC buy earthquake, not all. Um, a lot of lenders, a lot of people say, well, I just won't buy earthquake coverage. I always like to touch on this. Uh, a lot of lenders want to see earthquake coverage. Uh, so if you're an individual strata lot owner and you're buying a unit, they want to see the corporation have earthquake coverage. Um, same applies obviously for commercial corporations, entities buying commercial strata lots, the same, same applies from lenders. And I think that's important to know. Um, sewer backup, um, definitely um, almost all strata corporations in BC carry sewer backup coverage. Uh, I would argue it's water escape. So we, we include it, um, but it, you know, that's, I guess, up for debate. I don't know if Allison has opinion on that. Um, flood, um, uh, most strata corporations buy that. Once again, this is now a lot of this is, I think that could be potential water escape. I don't know, yeah. escaping from somewhere. I don't know, Allison, do you have an opinion on those two? Uh, some of those, I think the wording is ultimately, whether something constitutes water escape is really gonna depend, I think on the wording of the insurance policy. As I've right. always understood it, a water escape, it tends to be, uh, something that is uh, a sudden incident, like uh, a break in a common property su supply line or sure. um, a bathtub overflow, um, as opposed to uh, water seepage, which is a different issue, which is slow leaks. Uh, yeah. And those are typically excluded. Um, my understanding is water escape probably wouldn't include flood because flood is supposed to be like overland like it's 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 a source coming from outside of the strata as opposed to uh, a source within the strata itself and and then sewer uh, backup I've always understood to be a, a separate coverage but obviously that that I mean the, the fact that some of these terms are used in the strata property act without uh, definition, uh, does lead to the potential for uh, inconsistencies in insurance policy. So it's important, I think, when the council is looking at the insurance coverage, um, if you don't see some of these sort of obvious headings of insurance to ask the question, is it covered or not? Or what does water escape cover under this particular policy? Yeah, I think from our perspective, like we would, we would group, you know, like I said, all, all strata corporations pretty much that we insure have sewer backup flood coverages. I, I, I think this is coverage you need to have. Um, and and uh, I think that the act with the broadness of the word water escape uh, could very well encompass even flood. Um, and, and often, once again, you know, the act is one thing, but lenders require uh, other things. And obviously a lot of owners that are buying into uh, strata corporations or buying commercial parcels or whatever it may be, uh, will need lending and those lenders will require certain coverages. Um, so definitely worth the discussion uh, uh, on that topic. Uh, money and securities, um, you know, protecting the, the money of the, the corporation, um, potentially against theft, uh, fraud, that type of thing are optional coverages. Most of the programs in BC do include some coverage for that. Um, plants, I don't think animals so much. Plants, uh, definitely. Uh, landscaping, uh, that sort of stuff is something that strata corporations should, should carry coverage for. Uh, and often the policy will cover those off. It should be something you watch. Some, some policies do have limitations in there for landscaping, plants, that sort of stuff. When I say limitations, I mean limitations on values. Um, a lot of the big programs don't have those limitations. Um, environmental damage, restoration, pollution, that sort of thing. Um, a lot of the big programs include some coverage for that. It's, there's a fairly minimal cost to that coverage. Um, but you, you can look at those and say, you know, do we have these exposures? Do we need this coverage? 
um, and, and talk that through with your insurance representative. Um, loss of rent, income, we talked about that a bit. Uh, strata corporations can have many sources of income, uh, obviously commercial entities as well. Um, for strata corporations specifically, uh, TV towers on roofs, parking, laundry, uh, ownership of strata lots that they use for rental, um, all sorts of different sources of income. And you want to make sure, or we would recommend that there's coverage in place to cover that loss of income in the case of a, a claim caused by an insured peril. Uh, and I think I touched on the theft and fraud committed by the corporation. Um, some policies have exclusions for that sort of stuff. Some policies extend coverage for theft by theft by council members, theft by property manager, uh, et cetera. Um, so those are things you wanna discuss. You need to understand if that's an exposure for you. Uh, you wanna discuss that with your insurance broker and uh, come up with a solution if need be. Uh, Steve, before you go forward, uh, sure. just, just a question um, on flood. Are we referring to overland flood? So the Fraser River, for example, has a 200 year cycle and part of the valley has a, you know, a significant overland flood. Is that the kind of optional that we're talking about? And I know every policy is different and the wording is different, but is that the intent? Yeah, so when, that's the, I think, I'm glad you brought that up because often uh, I hear in presentations all the time where the word floods used and, and the, you know, people use, say the word flood for broken pipes and that sort of stuff. Um, it, when we get into insurance and we talk insurance definitions and perils in insurance, flood is overland flood. So that is uh, a river overflowing. It could be a tsunami. Uh, caused by an earthquake uh, could be considered flood as a definition in an insurance policy. Whereas broken pipe, sewer backup, that sort of thing, or broken pipe, uh, sprinkler, sp accidental trigger of a sprinkler head, that sort of thing, we would, we would say is the peril of water damage. Um, uh, so yeah, I think it's good to add clarification to that. Flood is over land flooding. It is true flooding. What happened in Calgary uh, a number of years ago, that was flooding. Um, um, and water damage is a much different thing. And there'll be, you'll see on insurance policies, there's separate deductibles for those perils. Uh, flood will typically be, you know, 2550, maybe if you're in a very high flood zone, 250, 500. Um, uh, that's like a catastrophe loss similar to earthquake. Um, so single deductible, obviously no unit owner is going to be responsible for causing a flood. Um, that would be uh, typically a shared deductible. Um, whereas water damage, much different, right? Unit owner could be found responsible for causing water damage. Uh, water damage comes from pipes, uh, accidental trigger, sprinkler head, uh, overflowing washing machine, that sort of stuff would be the peril of water. So one other example might be just a natural breach or failure of a dike enrichment. Exactly, exactly, okay. yep. Good. Every I should I should clarify. There's the disclaimer you put at the front's good. You know every insurance policy is different, right? And and these are things you really want to understand. But in general terms, yes, yes, that that would be flood. Yes. Um, I think we're back to you, Allison. Oh, okay. Uh, liability insurance. So I mentioned already that uh, strata corporations have to have a minimum of $2 million worth of liability insurance. And I would say pretty well every strata corporation should have more than $2 million. $2 million is not an awful lot, for example, in a case where somebody is catastrophically injured on the common property, even say from a slip and fall in the, the lobby, they hit their head, they're brain injured as a result of that. Uh, court, courts award damage is much higher than $2 million for that type of claim. Um, but ultimately what is appropriate as a level of liability coverage is uh, something that a strata corporation should discuss with its broker. And, and similarly, and we'll get into this a bit more in a second, uh, a section would too. And my understanding, and Steve can correct me if I'm wrong, is that um, the cost of upping your liability coverage is not significant. And so it's pretty well always in the strata's best interest to be getting more liability coverage to adequately cover off the kinds of 
risks that your strata corporation uh, poses, uh, both with respect to the way it was constructed and, in, and is used, but also the kinds of activities that are going to take place on, on um, um, within uh, the boundaries of the strata plan? Yeah, the, the only thing I'd add to that is, yeah, the, the cost to, to increase limits is fairly insignificant in the overall scheme of things. I mean, when you get into strata corporations insurance specifically, um, you know, 98% of the premium is in the property coverage and the rest is the additional coverages. Uh, a lot of the larger programs in BC for strata corporations offer significantly higher limits of coverage for liability. And to decrease to say two or five doesn't have much savings, if any, in some cases. Um, and the, the important thing on limits for liability is that's a very, it's not like property where you can get an appraisal and come up with a, a value to insure to mm -hmm. and, and you have a comfort level with that. With liability, um, I guess you could look, Allison, at case law um, mm -hmm. for, for these types of projects. I, I believe there's been, maybe not in BC, but um, definitely in Ontario, some significant cases in multi-unit residential properties where there's been losses in the, in the close to 20 mil range, not a lot. Mm -hmm. Liability claims um, aren't frequent, uh, especially large ones. Uh, but when they do happen, when there's a major injury, a death, long-term disability, um, future care costs can drive up uh, the amount of those losses significantly. I think you could look uh, at the auto industry to, to see some yeah. pretty uh, good examples of long-term care costs for injured parties. Um, so I, I think you're safer as a corporation when you're talking not a big premium difference to look at higher limits, but most certainly everyone needs to look at their own risks, what exists. Some people have swimming pools, hot tubs, uh, gyms, uh, climbing walls, <laughs> bowling alleys, all sorts <laughs> of stuff now. And um, the same applies for commercial entities, right? And the risk that they have, are they selling alcohol? Are they are doing all sorts of things? And we'll get into that a little later. Um, but um, yeah, you got to look at, the, it's not a, a general rule, I guess. Uh, okay, so uh, one of the topics big, for today's session is dealing with sections. And as a, as a starting point, um, you'll notice that there's no mention of types of strata lots, except sort of incidentally. Um, a strata corporation that adopts a bylaw dealing with types of strata lots, that doesn't create any specific rights or obligations with, with respect to insurance unto itself. Um, there is no ability um, contemplated by the Strata Property Act to take out insurance for a type of strata lot um, and, um, and, and uh, deal with insurance on that basis. Um, but the act does deal with sections and insurance, although it's a, probably a lot more limited than, than many people understand. So as a starting point, a section under the Strata Property Act is a separate legal entity from the Strata Corporation, and it, it's created by way of the Strata bylaws. Um, the Act says how you go about creating sections, but ultimately whether a section exists, one or more sections exist in a Strata Corporation, you can only determine that by going and looking at the Strata Corporation's bylaws. And um, the Act uh, allows for um, sections to be created um, to, for example, different, differentiate commercial versus residential, uh, apartment versus townhouse, and then within the commercial realm for uh, uh, commercial uh, stratas or stratas with a significant commercial component, there could be office versus retail. Um, there's um, some limits on the residential side, but it is more open-ended on the commercial side in terms of the kinds of sections that can be created. Um, under the Strata Property Act, the section has its own powers and duties. Um, and uh, you can also look at the bylaws to see how that has been expanded upon. A section does not have, um, well, it has a lot of the same obligations that a strata corporation may have. It's not quite as expansive, but it does, for example, have an obligation to have annual general meetings, uh, to have uh, its own operating budget, its own contingency reserve fund. It can adopt its own bylaws. 
Um, and um, turning over the next slide, uh, it does have to have a, an executive. So the executive is the equivalent of the strata council and it will, it is empowered under the act to make decisions on behalf of uh, the section. And the section may also have obligations to enforce the bylaws and the rules and then to uh, maintain and repair property. And again, one has to really look at the bylaws carefully in order to understand what exactly the section is responsible to repair and maintain. And then secondarily, what, uh, what obligations it has to enforce bylaws and rules. Um, and uh, there are some interesting uh, CRT decisions and court decisions that have come out on that particular uh, topic. And, and if, if there are any questions, then both the Strata Corporation and the, and the section may, be, may need to get legal advice in order to understand where the lines get drawn between the section's uh, obligations and the responsibilities and duties and powers, as opposed to those of the Strata Corporation. So um, I mentioned that um, the Strata Property Act does provide um, some ability on the behalf of a section to take out insurance, but it is limited. And in particular, Section 194 of the Strata Property Act states that a section may obtain insurance only against perils that are not insured by the Strata Corporation or for amounts that are in excess of amounts insured by the Strata Corporation. And over the last, I would say, year or so, um, while we've been working our way through the difficult insurance uh, situation in British Columbia, I've had a number of stratas come to me and say, um, can we insure on a, on a section basis with the uh, idea that the section might be able to take out insurance um, and, and it would be cheaper than if the strata corporation did that. Um, based on the way this section of the act is worded, I would say, no, that's not a possibility. Um, the section is only able to take out insurance to top up or um, uh, uh, sort of uh, add on to what the Strata Corporation has obtained and is required to obtain. Um, and examples I could think of off the top of my head, for example, uh, the Strata didn't take out earthquake insurance, then Theoretically, the, the commercial section or the residential section could do that. Um, and if the strata had taken out, say, $10 million worth of liability insurance and uh, the commercial section or the residential section was concerned about um, significant liabilities associated with activities within the um, the limited common property of the section. So for example, there might be a gym facility that is there only for the benefit of the residential uh, strata lot owners. Um, the residential section might wanna take out an additional insurance coverage for that. Um, but, but as I said, the starting point is that the strata corporation is the vehicle by which the strata corporation and the property and liability that we've already discussed is to be insured. And, in, and the section's ability to obtain insurance is going to be pretty limited. So um, if you look at um, the next slide, and I'll turn this over to Steve, um, we talk a bit more about where the split lies. Yeah, so, so yeah, great, great job, Allison. That really explains things, I think. Because um, certainly over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of confusion around this subject, I would say. And, and there seems to be more clarity today than there ever has been. Um, who insures what? Strata Corporation. You know, I think we touched on that already. Property damage. Uh, the, the Act requires property coverage, uh, full replacement cost coverage, um, and common assets, fixtures, etc. Also requires commercial general liability coverage. Um, so that, that's clear. I think really this slide is what I wanted to touch on is sort of our recommendations around coverage for sections. I mean, we heard that they have sections have separate executives. Um, they potentially have separate, separate bank accounts, separate funds. Um, so those are things that, that we would recommend, obviously not mandated under the act, but that we would recommend to sections. I think it's important for sections to consider their own DNO policy, directors and officers policy for their executive. I think it's important that they consider certain crime coverages, um, potentially their own legal expense policy. If that's of interest, uh, the sections potentially could be entering into their 
their own contracts, which could come under dispute that the Strata Corporation is not a con uh, part of. Uh, so these are all coverages that we would recommend to most sections. Um, but uh, once again, optional, not mandated by the Act, um, but uh, things that we think, think are important. So now we're turning over to the issue of airspace parcels. So um, uh, airspace parcel arrangements, as I typically call them, is, is essentially um, when uh, the property uh, on which a strata corporation, because we're talking about in the strata context, although a strata doesn't necessarily need to be in an airspace parcel. Um, essentially what happened was when the, the property was developed, it was divided into um, or subdivided into a number of parcels, one of which is called the remainder, um, which is essentially the parent parcel out of which the airspace parcels were created. And then, um, and then a number of air, one or more airspace parcels. Um, and the reason they're called airspace parcels is because the, the, the idea was to allow the column of air that exists um, uh, above the land to be subdivided into uh, multiple um, parcels. Um, and although they don't necessarily have to be um, stacked on top of each other, they can be in some cases, depending on where, the way that, that the property was developed, um, they could be adjacent or partially adjacent and partially on top of each other. So here's an example um, in, by description of a, a not uncommon arrangement. You've got a stratified residential parcel, parcel, so that's the strata corporation, and it is the remainder parcel. Um, and then it might be stacked on top of a non-stratified rental parcel. So in particular in the city of Vancouver, but in, in some of the other municipalities, when the properties are being developed, um, the municipality may impose um, requirements for the development that it consists of different kinds of uses and different kinds of interests in, in the property. And, and so one component could be a, a, res a, could be a rental parcel and it could be a rental commercial parcel or it could be a rental residential parcel depending on how the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the property was developed. But it's, 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 um, it's certainly a, a, a feature that we've seen more uh, often as our developments become more complicated. And then there might be on the ground level, um, a retail parcel, um, which is a non, again, a non stratified uh, parcel of land. Um, and so what will happen in this is there will be multiple parties involved, but on a very simplified level, uh, the strata corporation um, will handle the remainder parcel side of the arrangements. And then uh, there might be one company that owns airspace parcel one and a second company that owns airspace parcel two. And in theory, there is no limit to how many airspace parcels might, there could be in, in the arrangement. I mean, I know of uh, several where there are f four, five, six, a dozen uh, different airspace parcels and they get uh, very complicated in terms of how they all um, function. Now, what they will typically have in common is some sort, some level of sharing. Um, there may be shared access, there may be shared utilities, there may be shared facilities such as recreation centers or gyms. Um, there may be some obligations to share uh, maintenance and repair. Um, there may be easements in the arrangement. So even though one owner, say a airspace parcel one, has a uh, water supply line, um, it may have to run across uh, the strata property in order to uh, tie into the municipal mains. And so there may be easements to facilitate that occurring. There could be shared parking and storage. There could be shared liability, depending on uh, the arrangement. And there's often um, provision for shared costs for operations and for uh, joint use facilities such as um, loading docks and elevators and that kind of thing. Um, what's important to understand is that the Strata Property Act itself has no application to the arrangement amongst the parcels and the remainder parcel, the, all of the parcels. So, um, the arrangement between the Strata Corporation, Airspace Parcel 1 and Airspace Parcel 2 
is not governed by the Strata Property Act, although matters within the Strata Corporation are obviously governed by the Strata Property Act. What is important in an airspace parcel arrangement is all of the agreements that were put in place at the time of development, or in some cases, unfortunately, the agreements that were not put in place at the time of development, which can be just as much of a, an issue, um, that sets up how the parties are going to interact with each other and how the land, inter how the uh, use of the properties will interact with each other. Um, airspace parcel agreements, while they often have um, similarity in structure and in drafting, each one will be unique to the um, particular arrangement. Um, they are filed in the land title office. And if your strata corporation needs to find the airspace parcel agreements or reciprocal easement agreements, they're often called that too, um, you will find them listed on the common property record of the strata corporation. Um, and you will see um, both the ones that strata gets the benefit of and the ones that it is burdened uh, with. Yeah, I think this is over to me. I, I think so. Uh, if you took one thing away from all of that, these projects can be very complicated, <laughs> to say the least. Um, yeah, as Allison mentioned, I think we have some on the books that are 12, 14 different parcels, uh, ownership anywhere from hotel groups to strata corporations to to um, universities to city to the city of Vancouver um, owning different parcels and. You know, some of those parcels are subject to requirements on the Strata Property Act, and a bunch of them are not. And um, each of those agreements, uh, we were talking about this before, you know, each of those agreements are written differently um, outside of the Strata Property Act is, as, far as, um, as far as what's required, who's required to ensure what. Um, for example, some say that one parcel owner is responsible for the placement of insurance for the entire project. Uh, some parcels give um, some flexibility. Some say, ideally, they're insured together. There is a lot of differences within these agreements around how insurance is to be arranged. And so it's really, really important that your broker has a copy of, of all the documents pertaining to the airspace parcel agreement. Uh, sometimes the disclosure can be helpful in the beginning stages, um, cost sharing agreements. Uh, all that sort of stuff. It's really important that the insurance broker for the project has all of that stuff um, uh, so that they can do a proper analysis. And there's no simple answer to this stuff. These agreements need to be read, carefully read, uh, sometimes interpreted because <laughs> they're not always that clear. Um, and, and the solution needs to be come to to ensure these types of projects. Um, summary sheets like sometimes there's summary sheets explaining it sometimes there's not um, these documents are very complicated often hundreds and hundreds of pages uh, to get through everything if there's a lot of parcels so I think you know if I was to generalize sort of insurance for these projects and how our firm uh, leads with recommendations you know from a property perspective on these projects we're we're often pushing a shared policy for all parcel owners, uh, obviously where everyone's interests are showing, typically an appraisal on the entire complex showing a value per parcel so that costs can be broken down because not always are, is the insurance included in the cost sharing agreement. Um, and, and that's our recommendation as a firm. Um, ultimately, that doesn't always work uh, sometimes airspace parcels don't get along, uh, don't want to share policies uh, from a property perspective. Um, so you really got to work through each case, case by case. Obviously, the strata, the strata, if there's one involved, has to follow the requirements of the Act, has to meet the, gen the basic requirements of the Act uh, from a perspective of what they purchase. Um, and so, and then after you get outside of property, um, we do start to typically recommend parcels carry their own liability policies. Each parcel has their own exposures, um, potentially their own claims histories, their own all sorts of different things that could come into play. And uh, obviously a strata corporation might want to purchase the directors and officers policy, whereas a commercial parcel may not need that or want that. 
Um, so we typically push towards a, a shared sort of uh, insuring agreement for the building. Um, we think that makes sense in the case of a major loss um, where they're struck, you know, the, the top airspace parcel is being held up by the structure underneath. Um, uh, so you can't, you know, replace that upper parcel without the lower one being replaced. Um, but I will say there are parcels uh, in the city that are, are insured separately and that can be worked through, um, but it's not ideal. Um, that leads into all sorts of different questions around deductibles and who's responsible for deductibles and hopefully there's agreements in place that can address those. Um, but ultimately, if you're sharing, if we're talking strictly property, if you're sharing a property policy, all the parties named on the policy are responsible for the deductible. Now there could be bylaws or there could be things under the Strata Property Act that come into play or there could be something in the agreement about who's responsible, whether you can charge that deductible or make one parcel responsible for the deductible. Allison, maybe you could touch on that. That's heading into the legal world. Um, yeah. But in general, I think our, our recommendation, I think most brokers in the lower mainland are following this is that, that these buildings are insured on one policy um, uh, from a property perspective. Before you go into the deductible cycle though, Steve and Allison, sure. one of the variants that we've looked at and that I've seen on policies, um, and I know it's in my own building as a policy problem as well, is where you have an ASP um, and there's a condition within the um, agreement, within the easement, within the airspace parcel agreement um, that tries to define or sets out a definition for what happens if one of the airspace parcels is damaged significantly and they elect not to proceed with repairs. Um, because this, this, of course, has a consequence for everyone else who's in that airspace parcel. Um, and and are, is your insurance, does your insurance contemplate the likelihood of this? Because they, the risk of having a major, a major fire or an event in one of the airspace parcels is there, but what happens if the damage is such that they've chosen not to proceed with repairs? Yeah, I think from a, at least, just, sorry, just from an insurance perspective, once again, the reason why we push one property policy, why we push one appraisal company to appraise each each parcel is for exactly that reason, Tony. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, if if you don't have that, you, you could have that case where potentially a parcel owner doesn't insure their, their parcel at all and, and can't afford to rebuild. Uh, Allison, from a legal perspective, I'll hand that over to you as far as... Yeah, I'm not aware of any claims arising out of this kind of situation so far. Um, I mean, it, while we've had airspace parcel arrangements for a while in British Columbia, um, I'm not aware of any claims arising and certainly not of the catastrophic type. Um, and there's, I mean, there's some interesting, at least from a lawyer's perspective, there's some interesting issues about how these agreements that purport to say one thing, for example, we will rebuild in the event of a claim or a party must be rebuilt in the event of a claim and how that then interacts with the Strata Property Act where the Strata Property Act gives owners the option to make a decision not to, not to rebuild if a three quarter vote resolution is passed and then what happens there. Um, I think the other issue that could arise too is what if the building was at the end of its useful cycle in any event and one owner wanted to rebuild and the other one didn't and it, did it does it make sense in those circumstances to rebuild? So I think the, the reality is a lot of these are going to be sort of unknowns until uh, and, and, and we can speculate uh, and, and potentially draft agreements that, that deal with it. But until one of these claims necessarily happens, we don't, we don't, oh, we, we won't necessarily know what the answer to the problem is. So. Um, okay, super. Um, thank you. It, um, did we cover this slide? I think we did. Yeah. Uh, commercial enterprise. Yep. 
Yeah, so we, we've touched on this a bit already, but many, many strata corporations uh, include commercial enterprises, um, some operated by the strata or by an owner of a strata lot. Uh, some good examples here, golf courses, marine airports, <laughs> riding stables, uh, resort properties, a uh, ton of stratified resort properties in BC uh, where, you know, full-blown hotels are being operated out of uh, stratified uh, resorts, we'll call them. Um, and uh, so lot, lots of risk that can go along with this that aren't, let's call it typical to a residential strata corporation. And really, like we can't get into specifics on each of these, but I, I think the point of this slide is like to understand that when those, when those, ex when you're, when you're outside of the, the box, I guess we'll call it a, a multi-unit residential stratas, all these things need to be discussed, right? Uh, with your broker, uh, you need to make sure your broker is aware that these operations are taking place um, on the property. One, two, that you're operating them potentially as a strata corporation, um, or maybe you're leasing the operations. Like I'm thinking restaurants in in some of these uh, properties are leased out to a third party, and and just making sure your interests are protected. Your broker should be able to walk you through. Um, all the different exposures that exist and make sure that you have the proper coverages in place uh, to make sure that if that, if that uh, claim happens, that, that you're protected. Um, and, and a lot of this stuff may be, um, you know, more commercial general liability related. So you may very well, you know, the act says you have to have um, liability insurance. Um, but uh, if you don't, if the proper operations aren't disclosed, you could run into issues on a policy. I mean, the, 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 the liability insurers for the strata corporation need to know what's happening on there. If it's not just the, you know, if the operations for the, the corporation are listed as a residential strata corporation, but um, you, you're running it as a hotel um, and, mm -hmm. and they need to, you know, the insurers need to be aware of that. They need to underwrite that risk. They need to charge a premium for that risk. And if the policy just says residential strata corporation, you could run into some coverage issues uh, if a claim arises from the operation in question that hasn't been disclosed. Um, uh, marinas, for example, may require standalone marina specific policies, marine, marine operators liability coverage. Some of these marinas are significant. Like there's some in Vancouver that the entire strata corporation is just a marina. Uh, they have get they you know they've the they've got gas operations, pollution exposures, uh, all sorts of things that exist. Um, so just really important to have these discussions with your insurance broker and make sure the right coverages are in place. Steve, one of the questions that comes from this frequently from strata corporations. Um, and this relates often to bare land stratas that have golf courses as part of their developments. Um, and, sure. the question, and the question is, is there a difference in the exposure of li liability to the owners if the golf course, let's say it's strata lot one, if the golf course is owned by the strata corporation versus strata lot one, the golf course being owned by an independent owner slash company? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if the if the Strata Corporation owns the golf course, is operating the golf course, um, all the exposures that come along with operating a golf course exist, right? Uh, potentially food and beverage operations, um, um, uh, bodily injury related to um, within that Strata lot, I guess, related to the operations of the golf course. Uh, significant. Whereas if you have a, a third party that's purchased Strata Lot 1, which is a golf course, uh, and they're operating it um, as a golf course, if that's a, if that's a scenario, um, I'm not sure I've seen that, but could be, um, then um, yeah, that owner is going to take on a lot of the operations exposure, food and bev, uh, potentially maintenance, repair of that, that within that Strata Lot. Um, that sort of thing. So more, I would say more exposure sits with that owner that's operating. Uh, but still, either way, you need to let your strata insurers know that there's a, a restaurant or a golf course or whatever it is within. And you're, you know, most brokers ask these questions. These aren't things that um, always necessarily have to think of. Brokers are asking these questions through applications, through conversations, um, that sort of thing. Hopefully that helps.
Yeah, super. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I think we talked on this, just fully disclosing everything to the insurance broker around activities, operations that Strata Corporation is involved with. Um, I think so. Yeah, I think identifying all risks, you know, there's so many things happening in Strata Corporations these days, like public parks and uh, amenities and um, boardwalks going through strata property, um, easements, all sorts of things. It's really important um, that your broker knows about all this stuff, is made aware of it. And then from there, it actually can get quite simple. It's just a matter of ensuring all those risks. Um, on the next slide, it, it goes more in detail to the um, activities on golf courses. And one of the questions um, that we had earlier um, related to interaction with wildlife. Um, and if, if the Strata Corporation hasn't actually disclosed or educated to the users of the golf course and somebody's bit by a rattlesnake, for example, um, you know, the consequences are quite serious, but, but A, we have the duty of the Strata, but, but from a liability perspective, um, it, it imposes a fair amount of liability on the Strata Corporation as well. Yeah, so let's let's talk about actually insurance policies. So you've got a golf course. I think the a rattlesnake was used as an example. Um, the the uh, Strata Corporation owns the golf course, operates the golf course. They they disclose that operation to the broker. The broker uh, in turn discloses it to the insurer being used. The insurer takes on that risk of the operations, um, and and something happens, right? Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully there's some signs, that sort of thing, but I'm not, not sure. There, there's nothing typically in the insurance policy that requires that. Uh, there could be. There could be a warranty that requires certain things. Um, that's pretty risk specific, but um, if someone's bit and gets injured and the Strata Corporation gets sued for that bodily injury caused by the rattlesnake, uh, if all those boxes are checked, operations disclosed, insurer takes risk, um, then there should be some coverage there, uh, both from a defense perspective to defend the, the client, but also damages. If a court decides to award some damages or the insurer decides to, to settle, um, there should be some coverage there. Um, hopefully that answers the question. Um, yeah, but it's, you know, it's, I think the cautionary tale here for strata corporations is they have to be perfectly honest and fully disclose all of the conditions that they're exposed to, to their brokers sure. when they're negotiating these policies. Because we come across a number of strata corporations that seriously are not sufficiently insured. Yeah, I review lots of policies where, you know, the general thought of the ownership is that, that everything's covered. <laughs> but then you get into the actual wording and you, you see that maybe specific named insureds aren't listed or you see that that the operations, as I said, just says residential strata corporation. Um, and, and that's when you can run into some issues. So once again, open book, tell your broker everything, all the activities that are happening or your agent or whoever you're dealing with. And um, then, then it's on the broker to try to find a solution. Or in some cases, potentially, maybe there's not a solution available and that needs to be addressed in a, in a different way, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but then everyone's of the know, everyone understands what's in place, um, and everyone sleeps better at night, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, we're going to, um, uh, oh, the, and this slide here is really about uh, what's the right kind of liability insurance. Are there limits in the market to the amount of liability insurance available right now? Uh, uh, there, there, you know, I think most f depends on the operations. I got to be careful what I say, disclaimer again. <laughs> but um, yeah, there, there seems to be an availability of, of liability coverage in the market right now. Most limits can be purchased. Um, typically, you know, on a commercial general liability primary policy, you know, you may be capped at five or 10 million, but there's excess available. Like some corporations carry hundreds, hundreds of millions. Of dollars worth of liability coverage, not strata corporations, but commercial entities, that sort of thing. Um, so in most cases, there's something available, then you just got to explore costs, 
as, as far as, you know, how much risk are you willing to take versus cost to purchase to remove that risk. Um, but in most cases, in most of these developments, there's limit, like most limits can be purchased. Um, and like I said, a lot of the big programs that write this, the majority of this stuff offer 20, 30 million of coverage. Um, and it's typically coming in at a cost of what, you know, a much lower limit would traditionally cost uh, just because there's so many clients in those programs. Um, yeah, activities, I mean, we could get into, I think we touched on all the different activities that can create yeah. additional exposures. Um, obviously, you know, corporations or mixed use developments in, in areas where there's more snow um, or resort type properties where you have more people flowing through, um, potentially drinking alcohol, all sorts of different things that creates additional exposures, uh, golf courses, that sort of stuff. Uh, so in those cases, you'll want to review a couple, you know, make sure you have a limit high enough and potentially look to purchase a higher limit to, to cover off some of those exposures. Uh, we just added these slides. We're running out of time drastically. Um, sure. We just added these slides um, about the deductibles, um, just as a reminder to everybody. Um, and we added, more importantly, um, the chart when a claim arises who is responsible. And this really has to do more than with anything above who pays if it's above or below the deductible. And we have this great chart from Clark Wilson um, that's included in the presentation that's also on the CHOA website. But essentially, if the amount is above the deductible and it's a claim of the corporation, um, it's a common expense of the corporation. And if someone's responsible, the corporation may recover that amount from that person, depending on the bylaws and the cause. Um, if it's below the deductible, people just need to remember that they're still principally responsible for the repair and maintenance of their strata lots. And it could mean each person is responsible under their own insurance to have their strata lots repaired. Um, so it's, you know, in a nutshell, but look closely at the, at the, um, the chart, um, take a few minutes um, because we have one or two questions that I really want to ask um, before we get to the very end. Um, and so I've just moved us along into question time here. And I think this is a good question for Allison um, because this, this is coming up quite a lot lately. And I, and I think it's a liability um, that councils and property managers seriously need to contemplate. And, and it is what authority would a strata council have to exclude an optional coverage such as earthquake or overland flood without the consent of the owners? Well, I guess the first comment I'm going to make is I'm not aware of any case law on the issue, but I think I always go back to when I'm asked questions like that is what is the strata corporation's obligation to the owners and what is the council's obligation um, our, our council members' obligations under the Strata Property Act. And um, the act sets out this, in section 31, a Strata Council member's uh, uh, duty to uh, the Strata Corporation is to act in good faith and in the best interests of the Strata Corporation and to do what's sort of reasonably prudent in the circumstances. And, uh, and so in my, own, in my own view, if the Strata Corporation has traditionally had a significant coverage like earthquake coverage and all of a sudden it wants to the, the council members have decided to remove that from coverage I think there's a reasonable argument that that should go to the owners for at least some discussion and potentially a direction there is no formal vote under the strata property act for that kind of uh, uh, change but I mean one of the reasons why you would be doing I mean, removing earthquake coverage or removing sewer backup coverage or removing flood coverage from the Stratus policy not only has an impact on the Strata Corporation, but more importantly, it has an impact on the owners. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Stratus pol calling it the Stratus policy is a misnomer because the Strata Corporation doesn't own the building. It doesn't own the Strata lots, except occasionally it might own like a recreation, it, it might own a caretaker suite or a Strata lot for a specific purpose but it's really the vehicle by which owners take out insurance to ensure that there's adequate insurance coverage. So by removing a coverage that the Strata Corporation has had in place for many years, 
the ultimate impact is not going to be so much on the strata corporation, but on the owners themselves who may find themselves without adequate insurance coverage in the event that the worst happened, uh, such as a, a major earthquake or even a minor earthquake um, or uh, a sewer backup in the event of a, 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 a claim. And I understand that the motivation right now, given how expensive insurance has, has has become to cut corners, but I think it's also often a false economy, if not always a false economy, to be cutting back um, on coverage in order to save a bit of money on the insurance premium. Um, it, it, I think it, it, on, the, on the books initially, it might appear to be a good idea, but I think in practice, it can set up more problems um, than it ultimately solves. Yeah, and don't, don't forget about lending. You know, always remember lending. Banks require this stuff in most cases. And if you're to remove these sort of coverages, very good chance that you would, that the owners would have a hard time getting mortgages, renewing mortgages. Um, there could be all sorts of complications that go along with it. In addition to the fact that if there's a major loss, a catastrophe loss, such as a flood or a quake, um, they're probably their single biggest asset as an individual isn't covered. Um, and, and to me, that is typically not worth the risk. And um, yeah, I, I think there's there's some improvements on the insurance premium sides, obviously happening at the moment. And, and I think uh, hopefully those, you know, most strata corporations won't be looking to remove those sort of coverages. Uh, thank you. So here's another question that relates to a section. Um, and I think it could apply. I'm gonna merge two questions together because I think it could apply. Um, somewhat in both, but if someone, if a person is injured on a patio or balcony or a patio that is in a pub as part of a commercial section, whose insurance is responsible for the claim? Well, I think the first thing to identify is exactly what is the balcony on the strata plan or the area in which somebody was injured on the strata plan. Uh, in most cases, but I won't say it's universal because every strata plan is unique. Uh, in many cases, the uh, patio is common property or limited common property. And there is a decision of the BC Supreme Court uh, from a number of years ago, uh, but I think it still applies uh, given the wording of the Strata Property Act uh, in terms of insurance is that um, uh, and the way the insurance uh, uh, provisions are set up is that if somebody were injured on common property or limited common property, then the claim would go under the strata corporation's insurance policy. And then the question is going to be uh, whether or not there's any ability to recover against somebody else. And, and that might be, is it the ability to recover against an owner because the owner, for example, uh, wasn't uh, taking steps to repair and maintain on, the, on their balcony where the bylaws provide that they must do so. Or in the case of a commercial situation, they're running a patio. Uh, they have a, a patio where they're serving alcohol, for example, and that patio is limited common property. Um, again, uh, there may be some ability to uh, recover the deductible against the owner of the commercial operation. Um, but the expectation that that would be that the claim would go under the stratus policy. Um, we don't have an awful lot of case law on this issue, but I think the expectation is if that, if the claim actually arises within a strata lot, the boundaries of a strata lot, not common property, not part of the limited common property, then it is the insurance of the individual owner um, or tenant um, that would respond to the claim. But um, surprisingly, after all these years of uh, strata corporations being in existence and this first strata legislation came in in the mid-1960s, we don't actually have an awful lot of uh, court decisions on um, how insurance claims are going to be managed in the strata situation. Yeah, ultimately, Tony, I would just also consider named insureds, right? So yeah, there's, there's the, the courts are going to determine, I guess, who's at fault. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, a, lot of, a lot of parties are going to be named. And um, the, you know, if, if it's, this, I think the important things are that the parties have insurance, right? So if the strata corporation has an insurance policy for liability and they're found responsible, that policy is going to respond to defend and um, to pay any damages that are potentially awarded or settled. Um, and the same goes for, 
for an individual tenant or unit owner, uh, commercial tenant, commercial owner, commercial operations. Uh, they want to have an insurance policy that names them. Um, the courts will determine <laughs> ultimately who's going to pay. Um, and, and I think that's the, the best way to look at it. When you get into sections, because you didn't mention sections, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, you know, the, the strata policy in, for most parts are covering the sections for commercial general liability. So um, I, I would say that that policy is going to respond to pretend, protect the defend, sorry, uh, the strata corporation and the section um, and ultimately pay any damages that are awarded. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's great. Um, yeah. What you basically said in a nutshell is everybody needs to be fully insured and everybody gets sued. So that's okay. <laughs> yeah, ultimately, like we've seen a case recently, like it, often parties get dragged in when they have nothing to do with it, right? And yes. Ultimately, they're going to need a defense, right? Yeah. And uh, ideally, they have insurance that covers that. Okay, one more quick question, and I think it's self-answering, but Steve, if you can just add a bit more to this. Um, sure. Fairland Strata, 15 years ago in Vancouver Island, they have a golf course, they have other amenities, but they accidentally spilled a waste barrel into a creek and ended up having to pay a $25,000 fine. Is that the type of thing that environmental insurance covers? It could, right? Every, every wording is different, but yeah, that, that would be considered a pollution liability and... and depending on the wording of the policy, should should offer some coverage coverage for that. Brilliant, thank you so much. Thanks for, to the participants, Allison, Steve, you're brilliant. Thank you so much for doing this today. Uh, if Again, if you have any questions, you're welcome to email people directly um, for any um, additional information or assistance. Uh, and we hope to see everyone back again soon at a future webinar. And uh, if you have ideas for additional webinars for the future, drop us a note also. We'll have a look at those at the same time. Um, and um, again, um, thanks to everyone for your participation. That was just wonderful. And we'll see, each, see everyone soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Allison. Thank you. Bye. Bye for now.